Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for Stories Move Mountains. Um, I want to thank the World Economic Forum for this opportunity, and especially to Nico Daswani and his team, who have been such great, great partners in this. I'm Kara Murtis. I'm the project director for the Moving Image Strategies at Ford Foundation, and I'm super pleased to be here uh, to talk with these incredible women. We are here to discuss the powerful, animating principle of the New Narratives Lab taking place at the World Economic Forum. And that principle is, what if society were to treat artists as the leaders that they are? What new resources would be brought to bear? What kinds of creative leaderships will emerge? And what new futures can be better imagined with artists, not only at the table, but also setting some of the tables too? The Lab is a new fellowship program that begins to answer that question, and we are here with an extraordinary group of women leaders who joined the Lab as its first cohort, launched one year ago in real life at Davos. The new Narratives Lab began, as all things do, as an idea, an instinct, a, a conviction in a way, as internationally renowned artist and Crystal Award winner Lynette Walworth began to consider how to extend the experience she has had as an artist and a leader at the World Economic Forum. And through these networks, she wanted to extend that experience. And she brought this idea to two people who had been working with her on a variety of projects. Uh, one was Nico Daswani, who I just mentioned, who is the cultural lead at the World Economic Forum, and myself at Ford Foundation. Uh, then I was director of Just Films. But I'd been uh, able to work uh, with Lynette on several of her immersive videos. And together, the three of us set out on a journey to design a program that would support and strengthen creative leadership. And of course, this was all led by Lynette as artistic director. Very soon, three remarkable women leaders accepted the opportunity to be in the first cohort. And in addition to Lynette, with us today are Wanuri Kahiu. She is the filmmaker of Rafiki, the first Kenyan film to premiere at Cannes Film Festival, and she's also the founder of Afro Bubblegum. Tanda Hopa is a diversity advocate. She's an international model. She's a lawyer, and she's the founder of Tanda Hopa Media. And Rena Effendi is an internationally renowned photojournalist with National Geographic and many other platforms. And given the talent of our panelists and the brevity of time, the session is structured around a set of four eight to 10 minute conversations. And rather than taking questions at the end, as we often do, we want to invite everybody attending on Toplink and elsewhere, well, uh, I think it's only Toplink, to offer reflections and questions in the chat as you listen. And as we move through our discussion, we will work to incorporate some of these reflections and thoughts. But in other words, we're not going to all speak and then go to a Q&A at the end. We want to make this much more of a discussion and an exchange um, between these women. So also in the chat, for those of you on top link, will be links to their four extraordinary presentations uh, made last year at Davos. And I strongly encourage those of you who can to copy them and view them later. Uh, we've also included the link to Lynette Walworth's visionary acceptance speech at the 2020 forum. So I want to thank everybody for joining us, uh, for your time and your wisdom. Um, I'll start the panel with a quote that keep, helps me think about the crucial work of artists today, and it's from our very own president at Ford Foundation, Darren Walker, and he has said it so simply last year in a forum. He said, without artists, there is no justice. And in each of these artists' practices, there is a strong sense of justice defined and delivered differently, but towards a common vision. So let me start out with the first question uh, for all of you, and Rena will come to you first. And as you answer the first question, please let us know where you are now. And if you would tell us a story about your journey this past year, uh, one where the world's organizing principles are being tested as never before, and as individuals, we're all undergoing radically different experiences during this time. Could you talk about what you've learned about your own leadership and its impact? Were you surprises for you? Were there surprises for you in this past year? Um, 
So I'm a photographer and uh, my work normally takes me around the world, uh, especially in the past few years, I've really been zipping around the continents. In 2019 alone, I went to 22 countries in 12 months. And, you know, with this very unusual year, when everything came to a sudden standstill, it was very shocking for me. Uh, but also at the same time, I realized that that was the perfect moment to slow down and reflect upon my immediate surrounding. Now I'm in Istanbul, you asked me where I am. I am based in Istanbul. I've been living here for five years and I love, I love the city. Uh, although I rarely had a chance to, to work here because I've always treated it as a home base, as a place that I'd come back to uh, after an assignment. But Istanbul has a very diverse uh, social fabric. It has many layers of its cultural identity that I've always wanted to explore. And in a way, the lockdowns, this inability to travel allowed me to delve deeper into these various layers of stories in my own city. So I embarked on, uh, on a story about the people of Istanbul, about how they've adapted to this new reality. I photographed mostly non-essential workers whose lives have been completely derailed by the pandemic. People like entertainers and performers who lost their live audiences, uh, street vendors who could no longer be in the streets. You know, it could be anyone from a hammam scrubber who couldn't wash anyone because the hammams shut down, or an imam who delivered prayers in an empty mosque. And all these people, they've uh, shared with me their unique ways of overcoming these challenges, overcoming the pandemic, resisting these hardships. And I learned so much from them. Um, and through these, you know, microcosms that I've visited, that I was exposed to, the moods and the, the, the feelings of these people, they've kind of imprinted on me in a way that made me embrace the city uh, and, and truly call it a home in a way that I haven't been able to do before. Rena, that's a beautiful story, finding something in your local and things that you may have overlooked in the past because you were journeying around the world as so many of us did yeah. um, in the previous times. Um, mm -hmm. Tondo, okay. can I come to you and ask the same question? Um, well, I find, I think last year was quite a, uh, quite an interesting year for me politically. Um, you know, my work usually is of, um, you know, I couple the modeling with the advocacy. And when 2020 hit, what happened is that you had the culmination of the pandemic, um, everything that happened with the Black Lives Movement. And what actually happened with me then is that I needed to start documenting a great deal of things about race and racial discrimination. And... Um, the thing about race is that it is separate from, you know, um, racial discrimination and that racial in, in discrimination is inclusive of race, but then it also has color based discrimination. And I was experiencing both. So I was put in a constant position where I had to try and explain this pattern and this intersection of albinism and being black and trying to, you know, unpack institutionalized racism. And at this point in time, it really made me look back in history with regards to the relationship of race, normality, and how albinism culminates into this particular issue. And we started actually, you know, I started talking to a great deal of people and we started housing like little productions to try and communicate um, issues of race and racial discrimination. And I think for me, as a leader, one of the things that it's really taught me is to be honest, um, to be honest about this journey, to be honest about the complication, because, you know, each time I, I, I think I was trying to you know, place... Um, you know, to not somewhat divide myself with regards to this, but I think that with time, I learned that when you are honest and authentic in your leadership and with regards to talking about really sensitive political issues, then it's the best way for people to somewhat best understand and get to a solution. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, last year politically, it was quite it was quite interesting trying to unpack issues of race and racial discrimination. Um, so, yeah. 
Sando, that's an amazing story. And, you know, you are known worldwide, but you are very rooted in South Africa. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering whether or not this had a, a, you know, you were able to think about this work in an international way or that how, how did South Africa inform um, the, the particular kinds of research and, and analysis that you were doing? Now, this is the quite, quite the interesting thing, is that when I had to try and unpack issues and institutional issues of race and racial discrimination, um, because in the African context, how they tried to explain race and normality with regards to albinism was highly undocumented. And I, and I had to actually kind of look through you know, um, a great deal of Western history also to really understand how it is that we got here. Um, because with South Africa, you have a, like a, a history of racial discrimination through apartheid, institutionalized racism through apartheid. But what happened with regards to something like albinism was quite silent. And this is the issue of underrepresented groups is that in the absence of documentation, you experience erasure. And then in the present circumstances, you find issues um, of whether it's superstition or whether it's um, scientific bias on how to explain normality. You find those issues, but because you don't have the history documented enough to explain how you got here, it, it created like an added layer of complication. Um, and I think it's also one of the reasons why documentation became extremely important for me. Um, because if, if, if you don't have that narrative to contextualize whatever oppression or discrimination that is in place within that intersection, not just in terms of race, in terms of blackness, but within the intersection of having racial discrimination in terms of color, um, I think it's just it just became far more important to make sure that there is there is documentation, whether you do it through the modeling work or through writing or through, but you need to house these stories so that people in 50 or 100 years time better understand how time moved in terms of oppression, discrimination, justice, injustice, and so forth. They have something to basically unpack for them to understand the present um, because, you know, we are, we are here, we are witnesses of the time. So we have to document for a future generation for them to understand as witnesses what are the issues. And it's easier for them when they understand how they got to where they are. It's easier for them to carve out a future, um, you know, with regards to how to move forward and not repeat the same mistakes because one of the issues is patterns. Uh, discrimination and oppression usually just it has patterns so yeah Tando that is uh, amazing the work that you've done this year and it strikes me as visual artists all of you powerful visual artists some some of what you focus on is making the invisible visible again and Wonderé I'll come to you um, and have you talk about the the journey that you've had this year um, in your own leadership and your work I think it's been quite a radical shift as a filmmaker. Um, Like everybody here, I've been very used to traveling the world to be able to start or to have conversations with people about film or to pitch for films or to be part of the narrative. Um, But what's the most interesting thing that has been happening is because I haven't been able to travel, somehow I've had more access to more people and been in more meetings than I would have normally been invited to um, and, and contribute in that way, uh, which is, in, is, is incredibly important for everything that Tando said, for, for the need to document our nowness and, and who we are, but also for us to figure out how to take it and how to find courage um, about being seen as off mainstream, whatever, however mainstream is defined, wherever you are, um, and 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 learning that your voice is important. So my journey this year as a leader has been just trying to strengthen my voice, trying to move into rooms without apology, trying to ask for things that I feel like um, having a diverse cast or crew without without it seeming like it's either impossible 
or that it's a it's a large ask or without feeling any sort of colonial or patriarchal baggage that I know that I'm I am trying to get rid of myself at, in 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 these conversations um so some of it has just been learning how to show up fully present courageous and vulnerable at the same time and it's been it's been a really interesting moment it's fantastic um I wonder, Lynette, if you would give us an idea of your journey this year. Well, uh, so I'm in Sydney. It's close to midnight here. Um, and I, you know, like all of all, all these three amazing women, usually spend a lot of my time away from Australia um, making work or presenting work. And especially when a work has to be physically installed somewhere, generally I travel with it. So this has been a very unusual year. Um, last year, just to be to be in Sydney for the entire year. And a lot of the time not even able to leave our state, depending on the um, on the conditions that would allow us to travel or not or not travel even within the country so I very much felt myself to be on a on an island <laughs> for the first time really felt that sense of Australia as an island that I couldn't that I couldn't leave and I turned towards what was capturing my attention um, and one of those things was initially hearing the stories both here, but also in many, in, mostly in other places around the world, um, about people dying alone in hospitals. And I felt, okay, I can't make a work, but the tools I have and the skills I have, I could turn them towards this particular issue. And I approached um, a hospital with a concept of, um, being able to hand those tools that I work with, the virtual reality tools, the immersive camera and the immersive sound, to hand them over to families who were not able to visit their loved ones who are in hospital because of COVID. So I stopped being the maker. I just, I became the person who had knowledge and who could apply that knowledge to a new situation. And with the fortune of Australia not being overwhelmed with COVID, we are able to model something which we will be able to share. Um, that is, it's, you know, that gives something to people who are experiencing that terrible uh, wrench that someone they love, they can't get to. And these mm -hmm. immersive technologies um, can meet that gap it's not what I've done and it's not what I would normally do, but it's what the moment called for. Um, so that's one of the things I focused on. I hear a through line with every everybody, um, which is in this moment, stopping what you quote normally do and being where you are and finding your your practice, your, your, your being in that. I'm hearing authenticity, authenticity. I'm hearing access to places and people that you wouldn't normally have access to. Um, being present without apology and the idea of documentation. All of these are really, really powerful themes. Um, and this kind of experiment, something like the New Narratives Lab, um, in the best circumstances has unanticipated consequences. And one of the remarkable things that happened almost immediately when we met at Davos, all of us, uh, was the formation of a very powerful cohort among all of you, the four of you really, and then wider circles, including your mentors and wider circles, including the actual institutions that were supporting you. So I'm wondering if you can share some of the ways that you helped each other learn about your own creativity and leadership and also where you were challenged by each other to rethink your processes. So um, Reina, would you like to start again? Sure, yes. Um, well, um, uh, as a documentary photographer, my, my main focus is, is human interest stories. And as I tell these stories, uh, they eventually become visual narratives which reflect upon the lives of the people I photograph. And these people often are in very vulnerable situations. 
And as much as objectivity is, is very important for me, and I try to tell these stories truthfully without imposing judgment or having an agenda, I am a human being. And I, the camera in front of me is, is a machine, but I, as, a, as any other human being, I have a vantage point. I have a prism through which I tell these stories. You can call it a gaze, the gaze that's shaped by my cultural identity, by my worldview, belief systems, knowledge, etc. So in the sessions with everyone, with mentors and Tando and Wanuri, what was most inspiring uh, for me is, is uh, was, was exploring these leadership roles that are assigned to us to build these narratives. Uh, both our own and, and when we represent others. And in the course of many conversations, especially conversations with Wanuri and Tando, I realized that uh, this most important leadership role is what I call my journalistic responsibility. It's a responsibility not to misrepresent the people I photograph, not to perpetuate uh, harmful stereotypes, not to reinforce uh, social prejudices. And by listening to these perspectives, I've become acutely aware that there is a fine balance between reality and representation. And that's, that's the space that I, as a, as a journalist, I need to navigate it, not just with journalistic or artistic, but also with uh, cultural, social, and often political sensibilities. Wanuri and Tando, do you want to add on to that and make this, because I know you've been discussing amongst your yourselves mm -hmm. some of these issues. Um, you know, I will um, actually, and before I, I, I get to Rena, I'd actually like to tell you that the first thing that I learned quite early on when I started in the narratives lab was Wanuri's narrative of joy. Mm -hmm. And that has that really, I can't explain how that affected me, because especially as you know, a woman who is in, a, in an underrepresented group, and usually in visual media, you you know the, the stories that were extremely overwhelming, including stories of journalists, was the pain that came with being in this particular body, and. You know, when she spoke about joy as a form of resistance in narrative and artistic work, I, I, I can't tell you how often I would ask that question, whether we were doing campaigns or whether I was consulting with regards to how um, a particular person needs to be represented. And I would ask, where, what is their joy? And, you know, because I, I, I remember that that question is me saying, how do you tell the story in a form where this person, when they are represented and the identity group in which represents them, they see that they are deserving of joy, you know, and it's, it's, it's not that the narrative of pain is incorrect, not at all, because it is the truth, but it, it, it's that it is incomplete for a human experience. So it's one of the things that I, I, I definitely learned. Um, and with regards to Rena, so Rena and I spoke a lot about editorial control um, for underrepresented groups. And, you know, even the language of human interest stories really only came through when I, I was part of the narrative lab because I didn't have the language for it. I didn't, I didn't know um, what stories I usually would fall under, for instance. And when I realized that I fell under human interest stories, I realized that there is a, an issue of a power dynamic when it comes to representation. And what our, I, I understand that human interest stories are one of those avenues where you can regulate those power dynamics because underrepresented groups or vulnerable groups or prejudiced groups, they are, they are allowing you to be a conduit to tell their story. But at the same time, you need to balance it. And that's what Rena really, <laughs> she, she really um, pressed on this as a challenge to say, you need to balance it because journalistic work is characterized by objectivity. Um, and I think we were, we, so we have to try and find ways to both tell a story, but also be objective. So I would say um, in order for you to get editorial control, let's say, okay, can I have factual corrections? Can I have language corrections? Can I have cultural context co corrections? And by that, I mean, if you're doing an article about fashion, 
There is absolutely no need to explain that albinism is a genetic disorder, which is, you know, it's not, it's a genetic occurrence, but disorder is negative language, you know. And then you talk about it scientifically in a fashion editorial, you know, that's an issue of context. So um, so I, I started learning how to basically, you know, allow for that kind of collaboration between an artist or what they would call a subject. And, you know, the, the, the other storyteller who would be the journalist and so forth and kind of create that synergy in order for us to protect the integrity of both our work. But I think my conversations with Rena helped quite a lot with that. <laughs> well, Nuri, let me ask you to come in and talk a little bit more about your thinking about the, the joy in storytelling. And this is the basis of um, Afro Bubblegum. It's, it's how you think about your work. Um, could you talk a little bit more, take us a little bit more into your thinking? Yeah, I think that there has been and continues to be an absence of utopias created for people of color, whether it's in fiction or documentary, um, because uh, there is a very particular lens uh, or, or gaze, like Rena says, that has been imposed on us to the point that we have started to impose it on ourselves. So whenever we think that the only stories about us have to be hurt or broken or sad to be heard, and we forget that our joy is as important. And the utopias I'm, I speak about don't mean an absence of suffering or pain. It just means a space that is free of political oppression. And how do we create spaces and stories that allow us that? that allow us access into a future that is free of political oppression, that is full of hope, even though hope can be dark <laughs> and sometimes can be very daunting um, and is a harder emotion or is a harder word to say than even love. But how can we so firmly attach ourselves with that so that as we create, we are creating, we are the lights at the end of the tunnel, or we are creating more lights and more journeys and, and, and more ways that we can see ourselves. And this has been so, it has been so profoundly um, affected by our, our interactions as a whole, as a group, um, by Rena's continuous resilience and vulnerability whenever she shows up in moments of, of hurt, um, the way that she uses her lens almost as protection and the way that she concentrates on the humanity of issues has been such a fulfilling way to kind of move through the world. Um, and in one of our conversations, I remember Rena saying that um, for her, that's how she processes the world, is that she's able to take her, her camera out and process what is happening in the world through, through what she sees. And I took that on myself to see how I am processing my world through what I do, how I am internalizing everything that's happening, but giving it meaning so that what is happening is not forgotten, but also so that it doesn't create the unnecessary burdens of being scared to be around people. <laughs> How do we move past that so that we're, um, we're curious and, and so that the next film that we see and people are touching, we don't, we don't shrink back in fear <laughs> or worry about people being in buses and in, 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 in fictional spaces. You know, um, I think that it's, it's really helped inform the humanity of that. And for Tando has been really just a beautiful conversation about intersectionality in a way that I hadn't even began to consider. The layers upon layers of what humanity means and the processes that make us more political than human and how those shadings in between the, the, the definitions of people, how we have to reinvent them so that the language is positive, so that the language is affirming and how we we're just a lot more care in the use of descriptions, in the use of kindness, um, and in, in our involvement in moving through the world with that gaze, with, that, with the gaze of, of kindness and curiosity. That has really come from just deeply following Tanda's work past what she did last year, but also just kind of Google stalking her. I think has been, it's been, it's been a joy and a, and, and a pleasure, but also I've just, I have to say, I'm also so excited, not only by my mentor who 
who, because I am, I have not only been a filmmaker, but an activist, um, because we're suing the government for freedom of expression, who said something really simple, which is be like a stone in water. Let the things run over you. And when you need to stand up, stand up. Don't stand up for everything. Don't fight about everything. Choose your battles and choose what washes over you. And that was a really powerful lesson at the beginning of last year. <laughs> really was applied. And then Lynette in all her beauty and brilliance has been an amazing confidant through this last year um, that I don't think would have happened in the same way if it wasn't for this, uh, if it wasn't for being part of this forum. And she's been somebody I've been able to call on and, and think things through and revise ideas um, and also just move through the world with grace and confidence. Um, and not be ashamed or shy to stand up for people who are underrepresented. That has been such a firm lesson from Lynette um, and has really taught me the need for diverse leadership, the need for vulnerable and compassionate leadership, but also the need for not taking things on, not just being in your full confidence um, without apology, um, it's, it's, it's been a joyous, joyous trip this past year, and I, and I really appreciate everybody for it. Well, Nori, that's uh, amazing. Lynette, I want to come to you because this discussion is making me think about something that you saw early on, I'm sure, even as you were thinking about what this lab could be, and that is this question of when you're not part of the dominant culture. I wonder if you could speak about that a little bit. Yeah, I... You know, I move um, into in different communities enough, and by benefit of invitation, um, um, have many friends, have many allies who 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 would not who do not come from, let's say, the dominant culture. And and I and the thing that is clear to me is clear to me from the rooms I move in, is that if you are that person from the dominant culture, you don't necessarily even know it. All you know is that you don't have to explain yourself. In those rooms, there's a given understanding that what you say will be understood, that the way you say it will be understood, that if you reiterate what someone else has said, that what you say will be taken notice of. It's, 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 it's not necessarily a subtle thing, Kara, as we know, but it's a, but it's a, it's a reality for anyone who is not of that group. It's a reality that what I see, what I have seen, what I've noticed and why I feel passionate about this group and this fellowship is that leadership should not be, diversity of leadership should not be that when people of, uh, people of cultural diversity, of difference, of different ways of being coming from different um, cultural experiences move into that room, they should not have to change who they are in order to join the conversation. They should not have to translate themselves. And for me, I feel, ex I feel extremely strongly that unless we have that diversity that allows for us to feel all at different times uncomfortable because we're not sure, we don't really quite understand what that person is saying. If we don't have that discomfort, we won't ask the question. If we don't ask the question, we don't push through to see where our differences are and find through conversation um, where we can meet and where we can move towards. Just as Rena and Tando are, are showing us here, these like different ways of moving through the world in their forms of work came together and tussled with one another, but because they were sitting around the same table, mm -hmm. equally representing themselves and their way of being, they learned from one another's experience and they came to different understandings and they pushed one another towards uh, a position that could hold and understand both, both ways of operating. And I, I just feel very passionately about this, 
one, what this group demonstrates, you can hear in their conversation, because they came together much more than we thought they might. We thought they might spend much more time with their mentors. They became teachers to one another in leadership. And it showed me, it affirmed to me what you, what Nico, what we all hoped for and what I think we need, which is diverse voices around any table, which we hope to be collegiate and to and we, where we hope to come to conversation, discussion and solution around global challenges. Because a monoculture teaches us nothing but itself. Lynette, thank you for that. I want to open up the idea that, that you all may have some insights for this audience um, who un undoubtedly have their own remarkable networks, initiatives, and institutions, and, and taking what you have learned about leadership and about the need for, as Lynette says, a kind of table of diverse voices that are engaged with each other. Um, how would you suggest that people uh, t look at their own networks and think about how they can support the kind of creative leadership that we all think is, is so important? What would you recommend for people listening as they think about their own work and their own, um, their, their own access to resources um, and to platforms? Any of you can go. I think one of the things that I find most important is to continuously advocate for institutions, audiences, people who are who think that there is value in having diverse voices, who think that there is value in, in different people telling stories or being part of a creation of a new world. And we know that there is a need for a new world, especially now, um, actively contributing and actively watching and actively participating with the, the, the filmmakers who are already there. So for example, if you think that um, LGBTQ plus filmmakers, voices are missing, support the ones that are there now, because we live in a time of data, whether it's on Netflix, whether you go and buy a ticket, support the voices so that they have the data to inform the ability to make the next film. Because so often what happens with us is, is financial censorship or data censorship, where people say, we don't have enough data for you to make these films because nobody is watching your films, you know? And so the only thing I can do is genuinely encourage audiences, genuinely encourage people who are lovers of art or people who are lovers of this kind of cultural leadership to support it. Find the people who you know and support them. And if you don't know them, find others <laughs> or look for others so that you can support those. And they're all across Netflix and Amazons and in the way that we're so interlinked in this day and age. But the responsibility is no longer just on the artists and just on the media outlets, but is as much on the audiences themselves to contribute and to literally do it for the data. Um, I would say the same thing. Um, I think, you know, you have to somewhat be deliberate about representation. Um, and what Renuri is talking about when she says data, data is representation. Um, it's just you have to be more deliberate about the avenues of representation in the instruments that you have institutionally. And as I said, data could be one of them. Um, I know that for me, I deal a great deal with intellectual property. That's another form where you can see how you can, you know, just house concepts and and facilitate concepts of ethical representation, uh, ethical storytelling, responsible storytelling, which is something that we're really talking about a great deal right now. And I think for me, the fellowship is one thing that really made it so, um, I, I don't know if I could say urgent and important uh, for me to 
even when I speak and campaign about this, that instruments of responsible storytelling need to be put up. And the only way really I feel that you can do that is if your leadership is extremely consultative because you don't know what is missing. Uh, and so similar to what uh, Lynette said is that if you are in the dominant culture, a great deal of the time, it's difficult for you to unearth the unseen without having consultative leadership because then you will know what it is that you're not seeing because an absence doesn't mean that there isn't a problem there. It means that you're just not seeing that issue. And I think one other thing is also to just cultivate a sense of being empathetic. And when I say empathetic, I mean perspective taking. Um, one of the things that also this, this fellowship has really done is that it's helped us learn how to take perspectives, even with even at times when we feel like we don't agree with one another, but as soon as you learn how to walk into somebody else's shoes, common ground becomes possible. Um, so, yeah. Um, I want to build on something that Wanuri mentioned. She mentioned audiences. Uh, that's something that's always uh, kind of been a challenge because, you know, for example, I work on social, on stories about social justice, social injustice, and my aim is to bring these stories to light. And one of the biggest challenges that I find is to engage the mass audiences, the mainstream audiences, to care more deeply about these stories. You know, one way to do it, of course, traditionally, is to publish stories in the media and the media as an institute, inst various institutions within the media to support uh, publishing these stories. But at the same time, uh, we're up against uh, the fact that um, today the attention span is very short. And we have today the social media, which is basically the main platform for storytelling. And we're up against uh, influencers, uh, you know, such as, you know, say influencer who's selling underwear, who gets a lot more uh, engagement and traffic on, on her feed than anything that I would ever post. So how, how to reconcile this challenge? Uh, how to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the only way for me is, is, is really to, uh, you know, hone in the skills of effective communication, become a better storyteller. But, but I still haven't come to grips with how to, to really change that mindset and how to make sure that even though the institutions are giving the space for these stories to be told, that the audience actually listens, you mm. know? So that's, I have more, not an answer, but another question to that question. Excellent. We have three minutes left. Um, yeah. And in this <laughs> final, it's gone fast. And so in this final, I'd love to have a flash round of each of you speaking for 20 seconds. And I'm going to quote Lynette's, uh, the end of her wonderful um, immersive experience, collision, collisions. Um, and she says in that there is what we do not know. And then there is what we come to know. And it's what we do next that will make a difference. So in these final minutes, I wonder if each of you could take 20 seconds to give us a glimpse into the future you see for yourself. Uh, and Lynette, let me start with you. I think it somehow links to, to the question that you'd asked just before, which is where, where do I see myself and what have I learned from this year? And those two things combine really, Cara. I think every door, every, every room I find myself in, every doorway that I've entered onward, when I see that there are not the voices there that can bring um, a collective of narratives that can help us understand who we are together, then I have to find the way to keep that door open and find the way to bring people in behind me. And that this year, this year with these amazing women has been an experience of what happens when you do that. And onward, to be honest, I just wanna keep doing it um, because it, it gives hope. It gives hope, it gives, it gives vibrancy and, um, and it enriches who we know ourselves to be. Mm. Uh, we literally have 60 seconds. Um, so, Reina, just a few words, Wanuri, just a few words, and Tando, you can close us out. Literally uh, well, 10 seconds. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to be a better uh, advocate for diversity. I, I myself have come a long way being an Azerbaijani photographer and now working for the Western media who I've convinced that my perspective matters. And I'd like to be a better advocate for others like me. 
Monori? I think it's creating spaces and stories where there's more compassion, hope, and more utopias so that we can carve out a future that is as important as our present and possibly even more so. And Tando, close us out. Um, I'd like to make sure that, you know, the work that I do, aspirations are not in conflict with opportunity. One thing Lynette would say to me is when I'm doing work, she'd say, help them imagine it. And if they imagine it, then the future can come into being, but make them see it. So that's the documentation that I would like to focus on in the future. This has been such a fantastic conversation. Thank you all for giving us your time and for sharing what you know. And thanks to everybody that has been listening in.